Okay, good evening, everyone. Shalom Aleichem, Bruchem Habayim. Welcome, hope you are doing well, staying healthy and safe. Liyayin Hara. Great to see you all, and a special welcome to our Soulful Fireside Chats this evening, and a super special welcome to our first guest, Bruchem Habayim, Rabbi Peshev. Can, can you see me and hear me? I can see you and hear you, and I'm admiring oh. your Soulful Fireside sweater right now. Thank you. I've Very got Soulful. Thank you. I don't, I, I have the fireplace, but no fire. It's much safer this way for me and for our children. I love it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me and for joining us back here in Chicago. I know it's uh, one of your stops on your world tours. Rabbi Vyshevkin, for those who don't know, is Director of Education for NCSY, as well as many other incredible hats that he wears. Uh, comedian extraordinaire, oh, talented author, amazing. Educator, professor at YU, Marbitz Torah, expert in sin and all kinds of averos, right? The author of Synagogue, great book on making ourselves feel better that we're all imperfect, but that's okay in the eyes of the bonus shalom. So I'm really appreciative that you take the time tonight to share with us. You look great. I hope you're doing well and your family is good. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And I miss you. That's all I could say. I miss you. I miss your sweater. Beautiful uh, backdrop you have. Thank you. Yours is, uh, is very scholarly. Mine is a little more, you know, relaxed. So maybe we're having these conversations. Maybe we could start in the, in the realm of, of thoughtful and soulful because you've done so many different things. Maybe just let's get started in terms of thinking about how you've nurtured your own neshama in your journey that has come a long way through different places, you know, uh, as having grown up in Baltimore and learned in Nair Yisrael, I know a little bit about that environment. Having been in YU, I know a little bit about in that environment, having uh, been a Talmud of Rav Weinberger. So I've kind of been following a little bit in your giant footsteps and <laughs> seeing and watching and learning, and maybe take some of our listeners and, and those who are joining us tonight through a little bit of a journey of your own development of your own neshama and how that's brought you to where you are. Wow, that's a fairly loaded question. Um, my journey, I've said many, many times, I think I already said it once today, um, there, I've been merited to learn from many, many prestigious rabbis and thinkers and leaders and authors. Uh, but if I took everything I learned from every rabbi, from every leader, from every author um, in my history on one side of the scale, it still would not outweigh what I have received from my parents. So that is really where it begins. My father is a, a hematologist oncologist. So our house was, had the heaviness of, uh, of crisis, the heaviness of difficulty. He took care of cancer. He just retired this week. Uh, Mazel tov, dad. I don't know that he knows about this, but- uh, Mazel tov, we gotta send him the link. Well, I will send That's in the awesome. link, and uh, and my mother is a is a Baal Neshama. She's a writer. She's an author, and she's a a a, a soulful person. Um, I have a hard time talking about my development because you know I'll I'll quote to you from a Gemara in in the sixth parak of Gittin, I believe. In the sixth parak of Gittin, in the Gemara, there is a there is a list of the praises of different Amorayim. And it introduces this whole list saying, Aisi ben Yehuda, He would list the praises of the rabbis and then he would go and you have all these rabbis and what were they praiseworthy for? And I remember the first time that I learned this when I was in Nair Yisroel and I said, Aisi ben Yehuda is not the introduction. That was his praise. His praise was is that he went around counting and recognizing the praises of his teachers. So it's a dangerous path to set me up because Aisi ben Yehuda in that respect is really an inspiration to me. I would literally take you, I, I can't begin but elementary school in South Shore, uh, my Rabbeim and my Rebbe is Saul Kamenetsky in DRS. I learned in um, in Shalavim with Rav Waxman and in Neri Yisroel with Rav Svi Berkowitz and Rav Ezra Neuberger. I learned in Shar Yashav in the summer times and with Dr. Elman and Rav, Rav Shechter and Wai. It's going to go on and it's going to bore the daylight out of your listeners. 
is going to be me listing all of these people who have formed and shaped who I am. So maybe let, let's let's distill it down a little bit in terms of thinking about your Ruchnius perspective, because there is an academic side of what you describe, there is a religious side, but then there's the spiritual side. Now, how do you see that? Because that's something that is something, it's something that's clearly important to you in your investment in learning Chassidus and speaking about it and writing about it, which a lot relates to, to a person's inner world. I do not bifurcate my life like that, meaning, um, in you know, I work at NCSY, which is part of the OU, and like any big Jewish nonprofit and any big company, they love talking about breaking down silos. Oh, they love it. Any opportunity, oh, we got to break down the silos. No more silos. Um, I don't have silos in my life. I don't have divisions in my life uh, between academic and spiritual and religious, and this is the learning part. I look at my life as a clown car. You know, when like all those clowns pack into the car? I got a lot of chevra in my vehicle, a lot of clowns in my car. Some of them are serious, some of them are academic. They're always in the car at all times. At different times, there are different people at the steering wheel. Sometimes I'm in an academic steering wheel. I don't kick the emotional or the spiritual side out. They're still in the car, sometimes they're in the front seat heckling or, or doing whatever. I, I don't, I have a hard time talking about my life like that because I don't think that inspiration and spirituality emerges in those strict categories. I was, I was never a Muster Seder guy. Like, okay, 15 minutes, let's get spiritual. Like it, it was never, it was never my thing. Like I am a deeply emotional person. I am a deeply intellectual person. And different times, there are different people driving, but they're always in the car. I never kick anybody out of the car unless they ask to go to the bathroom too often. But um, they're always there. So like, I, I, I kind of reject the assumption of the question. Have I been deeply moved reading a PhD? Absolutely. Have I, when learning Hasidus, been engaged in my in my intellectual academic um, just kind of perspective? Without a doubt, meaning that my my wrote a master's thesis on Hasidus. So I, I don't like the idea that like different times and disciplines are for different feelings. I think that you can bring an academic perspective to things that are deeply spiritual. And you can bring things that are deeply spiritual to the academic world. Awesome. So let's go with that. So I think in thinking about that, if, if people are really considering this idea, people could think for themselves about the different components of their lives and how they can integrate them. And even if it means one part of themselves, one voice is at the wheel at any given time, but making sure that all the other voices and the other parts feel welcome it's, I think it's a great muscle. I don't know how big your clown car is. I mean, you have a lot of Hever in there. It's gotta be bigger than a Chevy Volt. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's no, 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 no. Least... It's one of those big Rebby vans that has a, I clam the Mount, Mount Washington bumper sticker on the back. Awesome. Uh, look, the way I think of it, and I think of this with professional life too, like you have two pie charts. You have one pie chart, which is how you spend your time. Um, you spend your time at work, you spend your time with your family, you spend your time going to school or davening or learning or whatever it is. Then you have another pie chart with how you derive your satisfaction. Those two pie charts don't always cohere. You might have a third pie chart of, of the things you do to make money. Though it also doesn't cohere. But you just have to know that how you spend your time, you have to know where in this period of my life am I deriving satisfaction? And at some place, depending what age you are in your life, you should, you know, keep in mind, you know, what is actually paying the bills? Who, who, you know, who, who do I have to report to on this specific initiative? And I think all those are important. That's awesome. Well, one of the things that obviously comes through relating to the clown car Indian is, is your sense of humor. And I'm curious, you know, where that fits in, in that car, 
in terms of your experience in life, pulling that out? Because it must be incredibly rewarding to just be able to just, you know, do stand up whenever is necessary. You have that lull in the NCSY gig, you could just pull it out. Like, how awesome is that to utilize humor in all the different things that you describe? <laughs> humor for me is an act of desperation. It's, 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 a, it's a cry for help. Yeah, humor, hu the, the same thing that brings me to Hasidus and to Rapsadok and to, to sin and failure is the same thing that brings me to humor. It's, it's seeing the dissonance between the life that you have in front of you and the life that you imagined. It's being able to notice discrepancies. And um, Baruch Hashem, I've been so to have a life with a lot of discrepancies. So, you know, so everybody has discrepancies in their life. So some people, when they see discrepancies, they scream out and they cry. And I do that too. Some people, when they see discrepancies, they run to the base measures and I do that too. When some people see discrepancies, you got to just like, it's sometimes it's so ridiculous already. You're, you're left with almost no other choice than to make a joke. And once you learn how to do that and see those little minutia that you know lurk in the crevices of our everyday life, um, you really learn to, uh, to develop that sense of humor. Can I call you out? You pulled two George Bush at the debates just now. You know why George Bush in 1990 lost the debate? It's not 92. No, let me hear. With Clinton? Is this, is this live? Am I allowed to do this This now? is live. This oh, is live. I'm gonna get in trouble. In no, let's go. In 92, George Bush, when he was talking, when he was debating Bill Clinton, somebody got up and asked a question about the economic crisis. And, and George Bush, before he began his answer, he looked at his watch. He said, what the heck is this going to be over? And then he started answering, and he lost the whole room. And Bill Clinton, as you know, his ability... He's like talking to every person. You're checking your watch too much, brother. I love you. <laughs> you don't have to invite me back in. Am I in trouble? I don't want to no, get No, I just want to make sure <laughs> that I'm I want to leave time for 1840. I want to leave time for oh, humor. You're too I, sweet. You don't no, have to No, no, no. I got we got a budget. So we have a half. I, I can do this lined. like we could go like an hour and a half. It wouldn't be a problem. But I gotta budget my time. I gotta watch. You gotta I'm budget, gonna you ask gotta budget, you gotta budget, you gotta budget. I'm I'm on a budget here. This is the story of my my life. So any good bits that you just love to come back to? I was recently in Newark Airport for an 8:20 a.m. United flight to Chicago, where we had two minion. There was the Fisican minion and then the second minion. I'm telling you, that was like three bits just, just <laughs> right there. Airport minion. It's funny that you act and that you asked me that. It happens to be, and I've written about this in the past. I have a shita that I don't write. I'll make jokes, not live on a YouTube. I don't make jokes about davening. I davening is off limits to me. If I wanted to, I could make jokes about the shuckling and all the things that are happening. I think it's part of the sensitivity that I was trained in Mishpacha magazine. Because, you know, Mishmach is much more right wing than the community that I live in and the life that I live in every day. But we found a way to have dialogue and they taught me a lot. And one of the things that they taught me is that it needs to be constructive. And I'm so sensitive that somebody is going to be shuckling up a storm and davening sincerely. And all of a sudden he's going to have Beshefkin's column in his head thinking about the type of shuckle that he's doing. It's off. It's off limits. It's off limits. The thing. I like, I, I like talking about idioms and language of how Jewish people speak. I think my favorite top five column was the top five ways that Jewish men say, I don't know. That was one of my favorites. Guys hate saying, I don't know. And you ask a Jewish guy a question and all of a sudden they find a thousand ways to figure out how to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. They say, oh, Todd, they were showing him talk about it. It's a sugya. They'll say a thousand other things other than saying, I do not know. I like that, like that language, the idioms, the noises. I like making fun of Charles Terwitt. Charles Terwitt's my favorite. I'm not going to show you what the label is. It's not Charles Terwitt, but I think Twillery? it's probably a different. It's a Twillery. It might be a, I don't know. I have to check. Uh, but it's probably another Dan Steele's-esque shirt. It can't, <laughs> it's not, I wouldn't just walk like what I have. I would walk into a store and buy a shirt. I wouldn't even know what store to go to. 
How would I know? I mean, if it's not on Dan's deals, how, how would I know where to get it? It's a, a sensitive subject because, again, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details, but my heart tells me that you and I wear very different shirt sizes. And it is always with a great deal <coughs> of pain. Again, slim fit nowadays is a very generous category that I still can be a part of. But there's a part of me that thinks that you could actually fit into the extra slim fit. And no, that's a unfortunately. World, that's a world I don't live in. The world I'm no, not you know what? part of it. Those people that's aren't part in of the, life. But that's part of the beauty of Zoom. I could be in the Regent fit and you wouldn't be able to tell. You can Correct. hardly tell that it's me. <laughs> you barely you can, know. You, you know what I'm saying? You, you, would, you would hardly notice it. A hundred percent. So we really want to hear, I think, a little bit, and it's important for people out here in Chicago because, you know, things, it takes a little bit longer to get here. I have brothers-in-law in Baltimore. Can you imagine they make fun of me in Chicago from Baltimore that the Nugunim take longer to get here? Okay, <laughs> Michael, them. Tell us about 1840, because not everybody in Chicago knows about this project, this website, which, by the way, best website photograph. You have to check it out. Even if you're not going to read anything, you have to check out Rabbi David Beshevkin photograph on the 1840 website. Oh, that's very, you should know Terrific. that photograph, believe it or not, was from a Mishpacha magazine photo shoot. Very modern, very fancy. Um, Terrific. So tell us about it. 1840 began when a concerned parent came to me and said, I have a child who went to modern Orthodox yeshivas for 12 years and went afterwards to a secular college campus and came back with a thousand questions and a thousand issues. And how do we deal with this? And, and we had earlier conversations about how to address this. He said, let's, let's develop a curriculum to teach in the high schools. Let's do this, let's do that. And, and, I, and I told him that's not the way to do it. I think nowadays, it's important not just to speak the language of kind of modern day, what's on the minds of your everyday average Jew. You also have to embrace the medium. And the medium I think that we all live in today is this multimedia medium where you can have videos and podcasts and essays and everything living together. So what 1840 is meant to do, it's meant to address alienation different ways that Jews, not Jews who left, Jews who feel alienated, whether they're in their 20s or 30s, a lot of us are in our 40s, 50s, 60s. There's a sense of alienation that derives from three places. We have theological alienation, where there are questions about Torah, the development of halacha, and um, the, the you know, big questions about God that never got satisfact in a satisfactory way addressed. That's theological alienation. There's another kind of alienation that I would call sociological alienation, which is the orthodox world that I live in today, the Jewish world, the religious world that I live in today doesn't cohere, doesn't match up with the world that I was raised with. And I'm seeing dissonance, whether it's in the way that the community that I live in affiliates politically or the way that they treat different groups. There's a sense of alienation that a lot of people have a hard time articulating loudly or they'll get like pigeonholed, but there's a sense of alienation. Then I think there's emotional alienation. Emotional alienation is that the sense of satisfaction and meaning that I thought I would get out of my life in my younger years, I'm not living that life anymore. So whether it's theological, sociological or emotional alienation, what we do is we don't provide answers, we provide road signs and we provide entryways. And we say, look, this isn't an FAQ. It's not a cure of sight. I try to expose and present ideas and people of substance to help point a way to help assuage the pain of alienation. And ultimately, and ultimately, I'm hoping that people will be able to not just not be alienated, but to be able to embrace and rediscover the beauty, joy, and excitement of what Yiddishkeit and religious commitment offers. And we started in May of 2020, and every month since then, almost without fail, we've done a new topic. And we have, we're, we're taking a two-week break now. Um, we have new topics launching in February, March. We just finished the topic of social justice. and 
thank God you see and you, know, you deal with the topic with a sense of graciousness and without any sense of adversarialness, you're able to really reach a wide part of the population. You're really able to reach people, whether they're in Lakewood or they're Hasidish, or they left the Hasidic community, or they, they went, they grew up in the modern Orthodox community and they never found a voice. If you share ideas with graciousness and empathy and substance, you'll see people respond because everybody in one way or another has some sense of alienation in the way that they're trying to figure out how their religious lives cohere with the larger world that they live in today. It sounds like there's a lot of building connections. It's connections with people with these ideas and presenters and avenues. Is there a community, is there a way that people connect to each other around these ideas? That's a great question. We, we, have a, we have a Facebook page. We need to develop that much more because I see that there's a hunger for it. And we have not developed a community like that in a strong way. Meaning people are taking our content and bringing it back into their individual communities. I'll just say it's, it's, it's a strange name for an initiative like this, 1840. And you could check out our website, 18forty.org, 1840.org. Uh, Are you going to tell them why or don't tell them so that they can go check it out on the web? <laughs> or you could check us out why, but it's a strange name. And let, I'll just say quickly, it's named after the calendaric year, 1840. Why on earth would we give it that name? Because they ran out of acronyms with the word Judaism. They ran out of J acronyms. So we had to go with the year 1840. You know, you'll check it out. Um, and there's really an amazing story behind that. Okay, so now let's circle back the remaining time that we have to talk about NCSY. Amazing programs that over the years that you've created, but now we're in a totally different environment, whereas in normal times, NCSYers and advisors, they would have in-person interactions. There would be Latte and Learns or public school clubs or Shabbatonim, and a lot of that can't exist in the current climate. So what are ways that NCSYers and their advisors are doing to connect and what are you providing them with from an educational standpoint to enable them to, to thrive despite the challenges? Just, uh, you know, Rabbi Greenland does live here in Chicago. He may uh -oh. hear about this. So just be mindful, just say. I know I'm extraordinarily mindful. Chicago is the headquarters of National NCSY. <laughs> and uh, it's as close to even talk about NCSY in the Chicago area. I, I think that the main thing that we have done is we've literally started with the end. And let me explain what that is. You know, Corona placed um, difficulties on every family, every individual, and definitely every Jewish organization. And the challenge that it placed on NCSY is that the beginning of most people's NCSY journeys are these amazing events that we run, a Shabbaton, a Yarche Kala, a summer program. And then in an instant, that beginning was vanished in a moment. We didn't have that portal. So what we basically have done, and really in a way it's taught us something really amazing about the trajectory of the teenage religious experience, which is, let's start with the end. What's the point of all these Shabbatons? What's the point of, of all of Yarche Kala's in the summer program? It's to form an individual, one-on-one -on -one sincere connection with a teenager. And what we've done is we've shifted our emphasis. If we can't have mega big events, then we're gonna have mega small connections. And what we've done is we've invested extra resources to enhance the one-on-one -on -one relationship between teenagers and their advisors and their staff. Because what we have found and what we've really known all along is that the magic of religious growth and spirituality, it's propelled in these mega moments like Havdalah. But what sustains them are these individual connections and that sincere one-on-one, -on -one, a Havrusa, a phone call, a connecting with somebody in a very real way and that's where we've emphasized. So we've sent out materials, forum, boxes. Everybody's doing boxes. We did boxes way back in Shavuos of last year. 
but sending out things to foster and cultivate mega small events instead of mega big events. That's awesome. I don't know, did anyone's, uh, we're talking about Eden here, so I, did anyone's box come maybe a little bit damaged? Did they call for a refund? How did that go on, Shavuos? I know you sold a few, is this a, a thousand. Way, is this a polite way of asking for a refund, Rabbi Brand? <laughs> Are you trying, I want you to know. Do we, we owe you $13 for your box? No, but you should know that the cards that you gave me when we got together last May in Teaneck in the bagel shop uh, over Yontif, we went through all of the cards with our kids at the table. You know, both sides, the all the decks box, of cards. Sure. The NCSY box right here in Skokie, Illinois on Arcadia with our kids, teenagers, little... We did it all. We did the entire NCSY box. So you should just I love know that. that at least one person actually <laughs> did it. One person actually Nine did hard. it. hard. You have to make a scene afterwards. But yes. That's right. It's very hard to coordinate the mailings and this and that. Well, you know, we got, we got feedback and that stuff. But I think the main joy is watching a massive organization try to fill up and provide meaning in a very small space. And that's been something very special. That's awesome. Any specific highlights that you can reflect on? We started at the beginning of the conversation with your journey. We talked about humor and, and the soul and 1840 and NCSY. Any highlights that you feel like are really important as you're growing and as you're reflecting back on where you've been and where you're headed that people can be inspired by, whether it's maybe a shalashudas that, that you took with you at some point or a, a point of inspiration that people can feel, even if they never had it, but they, if they understand it, if they hear it from you, they can envision in their own mind and say, hey, well, I can hear how that person would be inspired by that. I can seek my own inspiration. The short answer is no. <laughs> don't, uh, don't hate me for it. Um, there's like, a, I, I, like, I feel like there's like an intimacy and in even like sharing that, that sort of thing. The thing that comes to mind for me more than anything else is teaching my son how to sing um, Devarim, the song from Reb Shmuel, Brazil, and Regesh. My son's four years old. He has a love for Jewish music. When we discovered that he loved Jewish music at Yarche Kala of 2019, um, and we didn't know how much he loved music, but he like fell in love right away. And we've been nurturing it since. And I taught him that song and to see the way that my son sings that song, which has always been a, a strong place in my heart. Um, and I was taught that song by Reb Shmuel Brazil himself, who's one of the great unsung heroes of Jewish music that the Jewish community, I wish, uh, paid more attention to old school regis. When Jewish music- Regis, yeah, that's the eighties. I mean, maybe well, some people when, are- bro, That's when Jewish music was oh, still, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, um, the people, remember cassettes those yes. are those, remember those rectangular plastic pieces that's crushed when you stepped on them there are few things more moving than the combination of passing along a masora whether it's to a child to a friend somebody who you're mentoring and taking the inspiration that animated your life and watching it animate somebody else's life um, I think, you know, like that great story from the Piazetsma, Piazetsna Rebbe, uh, who, 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 uh, who said to somebody, the Grest de Zach in the Velt, the greatest thing you could do to another, somebody else is to do another, another Jew, another Yiddah to do somebody, to do good by somebody else. And when that good is a song and something inspiring and something sweet, to pass along something that animated your life to somebody else. Um, there are a few things in my life that stand out more than that moment. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. I know it's personal, but it's certainly very meaningful. And thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. And everybody is welcome to continue to learn with Rabbi Beshevkin, to laugh, to be inspired, to grow. Check it out in 1840. He has every potential platform, social <laughs> media, Twitter, I don't, I don't know what else is out there. Uh, Dmash ideas, 1840.org. It's all, all there. Over, but it means a great deal to sit with you and connect with you in Amir Sashem, whether it's in a bagel store in Teaneck or in the- in, Or in, in Romanian, the, right here in Romanian. Or Romanian in Chicago. It should be in person together with a little bit of food. And uh, I miss you, brother. And thank you so much for, uh, for connecting sense. tonight. Thanks Take so care. much for taking the 10. Be well. Great to see you. Have Take a great care. night. What a very special guest joining us this evening. 
a special schus to have Rabbi David Veshevkin. And now our next guest. Can you see us and hear us, Rabbi Sprung? Shalom, Harav. How's it going? Ah, Rabbi Yitzi Sprung, Assistant Rabbi Congregation or Torah, Rabbi Ida Crown Jewish Academy, close personal friend and resident Kolo alumnus right here joining us. I apologize. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. I'm going to try to... Uh... You can't hear me? I can hear you and see you fine. You look great and you have a terrific background. I see the Svarim. Oh. It's all good. Can you hear me better now? I also noticed that you put the Yad Shuta right like next to your head. So you've got a little Rob Rabinovich in the screen. So we'll get we'll get there in a minute. I can you hear me? me? One second. I'm going to try again. Can you hear me now? Oh, so much better. Much better. Oh, beautiful. Many so you're right. You're, you're right square between the Ritva, the Rav, and Rav Rabinovich. Where else would a person want to where, be? Where else in, can anyone want to be? In life. Well, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Oh, thank to you so much for having me. What a us. pleasure and an honor. This is awesome. Uh, we, could, we could go all night, but I, I really want to focus our conversation. You know, we're talking about soulful fireside chats and thinking about how we can add meaning and ruchnius and direction into what we do. And you've had some remarkable role models in your family, in your life, in your Torah experience. So maybe if you could share with the community a little bit about where your roots are, because I think, I mean, you could tell me how that influences, but I think that that's something that you, that you carry with you and you also purvey it. it you exude that connection in the, the little maisluch and the ideas and the orientation. Maybe tell everybody a little bit where it really comes from. Oh my goodness. I feel like this is a big reveal. <laughs> um, I mean, they can look up the genealogy online, but it's, it's more fun when you tell it for real. Fair enough. Um, I guess the, the short version is that on my mother's side, it's sort of rabbis and teachers all the way back um, from my mother's father, who was the uh, Roshiva in Israel, Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, uh, to her grandfather, the founder of Nair Israel, um, but really just way back beyond that to the Salam Ruch Hasidim. I know that's your favorite part of the Weinberg side, of <laughs> course, no doubt. I know that just brings you so much joy. Um, I'll tell you a secret. Zaidi Ruderman's father was actually... Uh, he was a Malamid, but he was Chabad. He was a Chabad Malamid. Really? Is that, is that part of the Australian connection? Did you drop that name when you went there or not so much? You know, for uh, those who don't know Rabbi Sprung, no, I don't think that was, uh, spent some time in Australia, learning in Israel, in New York. Um, but maybe tell everybody a little bit about who Rav Ruderman Zechat Tzadik Lebracha was and also Rav Weinberg, because many people are not necessarily familiar with who he was and what he did in sure. building Torah in the United States coming from America. Sure. Um, so first of all, as you say, on the one hand, my family, my family tree exercises a great influence over who I want to be, how I see myself, how I exist. On the other end, I'm named for my great grandfather, which would make it obvious enough that I never met him. Um, my Zadie Ruderman was a very great Eloy, an extreme genius. Uh, they, they say that his father used to take him for very long walks uh, when he was young to make him first memorize Tanakh. He would just review Chumash and Nach over and over. Um, and then that grew into Mishnah and then Gemara. And he really, really knew everything. He took the pin test. Uh, there's no exaggeration. He actually knew everything. Um, and he became a very close... Talmud of the altar of Slobodka. Um, the altar was sort of a father figure to him. And he was, I, I take it, I, I'm given to understand, he was uh, considered to be a very great Talmud and, uh, and a, a massive Talmud Chacham there in the yeshiva in Slobodka. And when my great grandmother saw things turning the wrong direction in Europe, so he went to America, and along with his father-in-law, they actually founded a yeshiva first in New Haven, Connecticut. They moved over to Cleveland, where they had a yeshiva for a little while. And then he decided to found a yeshiva called Ner Yisrael, 
named for Rav Yisrael Salanter, who's the founder of the Musar movement, who was the inspiration for the Slobodka Yeshiva and other Musar Yeshivas like it. Um, and his goal was to make an even greater yeshiva than Slobodka, which is a legendary place. Um, but he was very ambitious. And when he started, there weren't so many yeshivas in America. Um, it's not a small feat. That's amazing. And Rob Weinberg, uh, also a, um, a Rosh Yeshiva. So you have a lot of Torah luminaries who you look up to. And I think that's something that is, is why it's, it's worthwhile for us to think about, even if we don't come from, you know, rabbinic families, to make sure that we have rabbinic role models. That's why I wanted to shift for a second for you to talk about maybe a rabbinic role model who is not a family member of yours, but somebody who you connected with intellectually and personally, who has influenced you, who people should get to meet, even if they have never heard of this particular person. Maybe you want to take us on a, a journey to a small hilltop outside of Yerushalayim. Oh, I would love to. So when I was in high school, there was a uh, Torah Mitzion Kolo in Australia. And the Rosh Kolo over there, Rabbi Yoni Rosenzweig, who's now a rabbi in Israel, uh, he went to Yeshivat Birkat Moshe and Malay Dumim. And I, in high school, I was getting very into the Rambam, and it was my understanding from some of the Hesder guys who were in that kolel and from Rabbi Rosenzweig that if, if you love the Rambam, you have to go to Malay Dami. So that's what I did. And the Rosh Yeshiva, Rav Nachum Eliezer Rabinovich of blessed memory, um, in so many ways, he, he wasn't just a student of the Rambam. Uh, I, I, you know, thank God, the Rambam was like one of the most, he was one of the clearest, most beautiful writers, I think probably in our entire history, very easy to read. So we're very, we're Zoha, we, we married to be able to read him very often. The Rosh Yeshiva, if you get a sense of the Rambam from his writings, it feels like he was more than a student. It was like he really was picking up his legacy um, and he was moving it forward. It was like an extension not in terms of personality, but in terms of, of his commitment to truth and clarity and systemization. You know, the, uh, Rav Rabinovich, had, he, he answered a lot of complicated halachic questions. And he would just routinely go back to, okay, well, what's the principle at hand from the Gemara? What, not what little halacha is here, what conceptual principle that would apply throughout the halachic system comes from Gemara X and then is applied by the Rambam. And where did the Rambam talk about this in a tshuva, right? Or what, what Medrash Halacha did he reference that talked about it or Sifra, Sifri, whatever. And he would bring it home with such clarity. Here's the principle. This is the source. This is what we do. And it was just a, a really pure commitment to clarity and, uh, and honesty, truth. I don't know. Nothing better than that. Yeah. And so what, what did you learn from him in addition to that approach to life? What were some of the issues that you saw that he clarified or Svarim that people should be familiar with? Because even though he was a rabbi in the United States, in Charleston, uh, before he went to Toronto, before he went to England, many people in America aren't familiar with him or with his work. So where could people get access to this this perspective, which included his PhD in mathematics, right? So, so where can people go? What are the ideas that you think people should learn about? Um, I don't think he would begrudge me if I would say, honestly, go read the Rambam. <laughs> it, you know, he, he wrote a commentary on most of the Mishnah Torah, uh, which is obviously not, uh, it's monumental. <laughs> it's just, it's monumental. Um, but even if you're just reading the Rambam without his commentary, go to the Rambam. Because Rav Rabinovich's contribution, I don't think, was in his chidushin. This was actually one of the things I, I most appreciated about him. You know, sometimes you meet, uh, you meet a great rabbi, and that rabbi will have an amazing charisma or energy. And it's like special to be in the room with him. 
for Rav Rabinovich, even though he walked around with the entirety of Torah literature in his mind, um, he was incredibly humble. He really did spend his career trying to explain the Rambam to people by using things the Rambam said that maybe people weren't aware of or they wouldn't have noticed, right? Shuvas that they wouldn't have seen or, you know, versions of the text that were hidden. His commitment wasn't in his originality or in his charisma. It was his humility and his commitment to bringing Torah and specifically, usually the Torah of the Rambam forward to light, something you might not have noticed before. I remember um, one of my friends, uh, we were learning once and he had some question. I, I don't recall offhand what it was. And he says, like, what do you think about this? I'm like, this is a great question. You got to ask the Rosh Yeshiva. Now, it's not that there wasn't anyone else in Yeshiva who could have answered, but it was exciting to go talk to the Rosh Yeshiva. So I said, you got to go to the Rosh Yeshiva. So he goes and he's, he's explaining, like, look at the Rambam, look at the Magad Mishnah. Here it is. Here's my question. And Rav Rabinovich says, yeah, but you put the comma in the wrong place. Like if you move it over three words, the whole thing's different and your question falls away. And that was his style. His style wasn't fancy. It was, look, what's the simplest version of this thing? And, and it's, a, a, it's a real humility that he had. His great chidushim, I don't know, every time you read something and someone's like, well, that's really controversial. And you're like, it's not controversial. That's the obvious shot. You know, it can't be controversial because he never said <laughs> anything that wasn't purely the shot. Um, I think that was, I don't know, maybe that was the most inspiring thing about him. It's, it's really counterintuitive. There are so many special people out there who are charismatic his specialty was humility and commitment to truth, to the simple understanding of things. Um, I found that really, I still do, I find it very inspiring. That's beautiful. And you that know, is I, inspiring. I, yeah. So I, I apologize. I, you know, look, go read his chuvas on the Ram, uh, his uh, commentary on the Rambam, the Abshuta, aptly named. It's the simple, right? It's, it's a simple commentary. He does, God willing, I believe there are essays that are going to be coming out in English translation, his philosophical essays, which touch on political science and philosophy and ethics, which is very, very exciting. I look forward certainly to seeing that in English. Go and read it the moment it comes out. It's gonna come out from Koran Magad Press, I believe, God willing, in a year or two. Um, and if you're interested in halacha and in fascinating contemporary halachic questions, go read his Shuva books, Malumde Milchama, which specifically dealt mostly with questions uh, for guys in the army who had all sorts of questions from, can I, carry a Sefer Torah out to the field to read it, you know, to read from it, or how do I make it say there when I'm, you know, on Shemira. Um, and Siach Nochem, which is just a fascinating book of contemporary halachic issues. Only new ones. I once asked him if he would make new, I, I, asked, I requested that he put out more chuvas. And he said, why? It's like, there are already lots of good books out there. He only wanted to put out chuvas that dealt with a new question, because otherwise there was no sense in publishing it. So awesome. go read his books. Go learn from him. That's go read beautiful. Rabbi Sachs. Rabbi Sachs delivered his philosophy to everybody. Rabbi Sachs is obviously his most famous student. You know, um, so I don't know. Go learn from him. That's awesome. So let's shift gears for a second from where you've come and what has shaped how you see things. And now with your role as a rabbi in the community and as a, an educator in the school, but really as a co alumnus who has stayed in Chicago, you know, for the time before you make Aliyah, please God, of all language, oh, Tova, Mirza Shem by all of us. Amen. You know, what is the goal of our community? What is the role that the Kolo and our Kolo community with our alumni, with our fellows, what do you see as our goal? What are we supposed to be doing here? Let's just begin with the end in mind. Let's just tell people, what are we trying to do? I'm so glad you asked that question. I just talked about this with my senior boys today in Michelin. You know, in, in Mishle, so Shlomo Amal says, Kol noam, right? All of the ways of wisdom and Torah are peaceful. And the Rambam quotes this to teach the importance of peace. The fact that Torah should be bringing peace in the world. And he quotes this at the end of uh, the laws of Hanukkah and Purim to teach that uh, if you only have right near Hanukkah or near Beto, if you only have enough money to light your Shabbos candles or your Hanukkah candles, so you have to light your Shabbos candles because they bring peace to the house. And the Rambam says that the entirety of the Torah can, and 
the, this is, I, I said to my seniors, like, do you know why you keep halacha? Do you know why the Torah is here? At least in the Rambam's opinion. The Rambam says three things. In the Mordor of Uchim, he says there are three goals. The Torah comes either to give us true opinions or to transform our character to be virtuous people or to create justice in a society. So it's very clear to me that the goal of our community and the kolal and every single person uh, in our community here and elsewhere, our goal is to learn and understand Ratzon Habore. We study Torah to understand what Hashem expects of us in order to transform ourselves uh, into ideal people and an ideal society. That's it. That's the pitch. Those are the Ramam's words. They're not words there are mine. But that, but that's, the, that's the whole thing. That's so. A, what do know, we need purpose. to do that? So what do we need to do? Maybe we should be learning Tanya. I mean, uh, maybe there's an opportunity to learn Tanya. Maybe there's you know oh, something so short, true. sweet, and deep. Or you know, what are some things that people can do or should be doing to really uh, to create that experience of meaning, of accomplishing in ruchnius, of bringing that shleimus into the world and into our lives. So now I'll quote Tanya, and I'll use this as an opportunity to, uh, to make a pitch. It's an ad. Please come learn Tanya with me at 1 p.m. on Wednesdays. Go look at the Ortora. Join, join Rabbi Sprung's Ortora Tanya Weekly Sheer. It is amazing. Oh, learn Tanya with a certified Litvak. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, by the way, I, I might be the most litvish or misnagdic person in america teaching tanya so i, I think awesome. that should be a claim for something please do join me if you're watching um so let's quote tanya for a moment so rabbi steinzaltz says in his very excellent very clear commentary on tanya um that in chapter two of the tanya the bala tanya is trying to help people understand that every person has a role to play in the world Everyone has something they need to accomplish, they need to do, that's unique to them. And uh, he actually tells like a, a lovely little story about a Hasidic Rebbe who got angry at one of his Hasidim. And he said, you're in great danger. And the Hasid said, what do you mean, Rebbe? This Hasid was a very wealthy man, but he had abandoned his business and his work in order to learn. He was spending full-time learning. He was going to learn from the Rebbe. You know, he was, he was growing in his Ruchnias. And the Rebbe said, you're in grave danger because every single person in Kla Yisrael is part of an army trying to accomplish something. And you've abandoned your brigade. You are supposed to be a philanthropist, but you're not making any money to give away. You could be gravely punished for this. So it, it seems to me that if we each have a role, the best way, I mean, I haven't yet understood the universe. I'm hoping by the time I go. Um, but it seems to me that the best way to become a deeper spiritual person is to lean in very hard into mashali bochafetz. Choose a mitzvah that speaks to you, right? The Gemara says, a million rabbis say, choose a mitzvah that speaks to you. It doesn't matter what it is. There are, a lot in, there are lots and lots of mitzvah. <laughs> choose a mitzvah that speaks to you and make that like the focus of your life. Do that thing. It, I'm sure there's a mitzvah out there that excites you, which you know uh, can help you flourish as an individual human being. Um, and you'll find it inspiring because it is inspiring for you. It just, it already is. It's, it's just a question of identifying what it is that moves you. Why and am I not surprised attend my that you're paraphrasing? Show. Yes. Why am I not surprised that you're paraphrasing a Rambam in the Pirsha Mishnais in the end of the third parak of Makos, where the Rambam says, oh, that's why there are 613 mitzvahs because different people connect to uh. different one. And all you need is one to really be the kind of Bishlemusa and to embrace it totally, and that's your ticket to Olamaba. It's always coming back to the Rambam. Even when that you're teaching awesome. Tanya, it comes back <laughs> to the Rambam. I love it. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Eretz Israel because you've had the opportunity to spend time there. You're hoping, please God, the aspiration to live there. How do we keep that as a focus for those of us who don't have that as a short, near-term goal to maintain that connection? Um, you know, that's a great question. I am not certain that every single person, I know this will maybe upset or disappoint some people. I'm not, I'm not so sure that every person needs to be focusing on living in the land of Israel on every given day or at a given moment. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, just, just to borrow from what we were just saying, you have to have a mitzvah. That mitzvah has to be the overarching theme of your life. So for a lot of people, it's proper chinuch for their kids, right? They get up in the morning, they're trying to raise their family properly. That needs to be their main focus. Um, so I don't think, I, I'm not, uh, let's say I'm not committed to the notion that we need to be walking around with terrific guilt if we're not yet able to live in the land of Israel for one reason or another, and there are lots of good reasons. Having said that, I am absolutely terrified by the notion that people no longer would feel like they're part of a Jewish people. The idea that someone could be so individualistic that they no longer feel like they are one part of a larger family whose home is in Israel, that goes against what Judaism is. We're supposed to be members of a broad nation, a broad family. Uh, we need to view ourselves that way. It's part of our identity. Um, so we do need to consistently find ways to give that expression and feed that as part of who we are. Um, and that could take, again, that could be different for everybody, but, but we need to be able to somehow feed our commitment to the Jewish people. Can't let that sit. So, right. So the idea of connection to Eretz Yisrael, it's not necessarily just, and certainly you see this a lot in the writings of Rav Cook, it's not just the land per se, but it's the land connected to the idea of the Uma, the nation, the collective family, something bigger than just ourselves. Well, uh, because we're making a habit of only saying things we've already said, um, you know, what gives Eretz Yisrael a special Kedusha? So the Rambam that's, says... That, well, that, that's quite a loaded question, isn't it? Okay, let's <laughs> yes, hear it. it so, okay, so, but, but ask this question, answer it how you're going to answer it, depending on whom you trust. The Rambam says, Rasal Vichik says, uh, the Gemara in Sota implies, right, why does Moshe Rabbeinu want to go into Eretz Yisrael so badly to taste its delicious fruit? Eretz Yisrael does have amazing fruit. That's undoubtedly. And uh, so, uh, Of course. Um, nonetheless, the purpose of Eretz Yisrael is, it seems to be that it's the place, that it's the sole place that is a full vehicle for serving Hashem. Um, so it's, if you take this perspective, I personally do, I think most people don't, but if you take this perspective, then yeah, you can, you need to figure out how you're going to serve Hashem best. And if Eretz Yisrael is the sole vehicle where the people of Israel can serve God, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to be there at a given moment and serve God best there. You really need to, you know, weigh that seriously. I remember I heard a great comment once uh, in our Shechter's name that if there was a choice between raising your children properly to be Shomer Torah Mitzvot and Yerushimayim and going to Israel, there would be no doubt that Chinuch would come first. Because Chinuch comes first, right? That's why God chose Avram. He said, because he, he's such a good mechanic, he wants to teach his children to be like him. Um, so if uh, I view the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael that way. I take it based on Meyer Bayam and, uh, and the Rambam that that's what Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael means. It's a vehicle for Torah and mitzvot. It's unlike anything else. Um, but for each person, that's different in practice. My hope is, is that everybody's going to be able to find that, that way, that personal connection, that, that the same Chalkeinu, that each one of us can find that unique connection. And it's probably true, not just in the world of mitzvot, but perhaps in the world of learning, right? Some people are going to connect to different aspects of learning than, than others. And that yeah. perhaps part of what you're saying is that we should feel good about that, not bad. You know, if you're inspired yeah, by one part of Yiddishkeit, we shouldn't be constantly looking over our shoulder and be like, well, I can't believe that guy does pre-Shabbos Ruach and that guy does like, you know, the best Tisha B'Av morning. Like, it's not really relevant, right? It's really about me and my connection to HaKadosh Baruch on an ongoing basis. 100%. Though, can I say something just on the other side? Yeah, please. Because it's, it's Rambam Philosophy Night here at the Soulful Fireside Chat. I think. Is, that, is that fair? <laughs> it's fair. It's Rambam Philosophy Night. So the Rambam says, I feel like, you know, I gave him more Nebuchim Shir last year. It's like, it's too late, people. You can't join it. Come to my tiny shir. But the Rambam says... One second, is it recorded? No, I apologize. It's not. It's not. If there's such a clamoring, I'll do another one. All right. <laughs> so the, uh, the Rambam says in the Lord of Uchim that the primary cause of pain and suffering in this world for, for us, for people, is that we pursue things we don't need. 
we get things that we don't need or we can't get things we don't need. And either it's very painful that we can't have it or when we get it, it's bad for us, right? Just imagine that piece of cake that we all have and we shouldn't, right? So I one think- two. Is that yeah. one or two pieces? That's exactly right. Sorry. Uh, I think that there are different reasons why we might not live in Israel. If we're honest with ourselves as a community, we are the richest people ever on the face of the planet, ever. If the reason we're not living in Israel is because we can't for family reasons or chinuch reasons or Torah reasons or whatever, I get it, obviously. But if it's our materialism, then we should probably be honest with ourselves. We are struggling with the materialism addiction um, and it's not good for us. We just need to be honest with ourselves. If that's really what it is, and this is easier said than done, okay? You know, it's a fantasy to go live in Israel and be a rabbi there. So I, I get it. I'm not the poster boy for sacrifice. Um, but if that's what's keeping us, who knows? Maybe, maybe we'd be a whole lot happier if we could make that happen for ourselves. And that's the purely selfish. That's the purely selfish reason to move. Just because we'll be better off. And maybe just to close it out for tonight, bringing it back here in the present, maybe we need to think about that, whether we're going to Israel or we're in Israel or not, making sure that we're orienting our lives around the kind of values that bring us closer to Hashem and approaching those vehicles of Torah and mitzvot and keeping some of that materialism in check because Baruch Hashem for all the incredible blessings that we have. Yes, there are many people and we need to be machazic them who during this particular tukufa of the pandemic are really, really struggling. But as a whole, I think it's important to constantly be self-aware of the difference between what you said of what we need and what we have and what we want. And how do we make sure that we keep coming back to what's meaningful and what we need rather than keeping up with whatever materialistic standards are being promoted, especially and accentuated online. Yeah. Can, can, I, um, can I just say one thing I've been drawing a lot of inspiration from? I would love for you to say that. And that will actually, because it's something you've been just drawing inspiration from, it'll just end this evening, take us into Arab Shabbos in uh. the most magnificent way. So why, why don't you please close out this hour, this soulful fireside chat right here live. I mean, I could probably hit your house with a really good yeah. football throw, but so I'll see you after. Just let's, uh, let's wrap it up tonight. This beautiful house to house chat with, oh. with an important message. Um, I have the privilege of teaching Torah to adults at Shul, to teenagers at the Academy. I, I just have to tell you, because a lot of people are upset and depressed for many reasons, good reasons. If you go into a room where there are people who are gathering to learn Torah, it's going to make you happier. I'm, I get to be in a good mood all the time because it is inspiring. People are literally coming on Zoom or going to Shul or whatever just to learn Torah and it's totally transformative and it's exciting. I have drawn much, much joy and inspiration from it. Um, if you, if you do it, if you feel sad about the world right now, go, go to a shir every day. You'll feel happy about the world because you'll see it's really going in the right direction. So that's my chizuk. I'm telling you, try it. There are no negative side effects. There are Complete with Olam Haba in store and personal Complete. satisfaction in the moment, as you're saying. Batteries Schar are included. That's right. Schar mitzvah me'ika. Rabbi Sprung, you're the mamish the best. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank, Thank you, everybody, so much. for joining us. Everybody, good Aaron Shabbos. Look forward to seeing you again soon. All, please God, in person, not virtual. But in the meantime, you can catch Rabbi Beshevkin. You can catch Rabbi Sprung. You can catch so many cool opportunities online. So please continue to join us.